Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Free-flowing talk with a charismatic, down-to-earth host. Join Dean as he interviews and chats freely with his guests, ranging from superstar athletes to politicians, industry titans, and everyday folk with fascinating life stories. Dean educates, entertains, and most of all, touches people's lives. You're listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dean Blackman Show. Uh, and uh, this is your host, Dean. My featured guest today is uh, Steve Albert, whom I consider a legendary, world-class, fine art painter. Steve, welcome to The Dean Blackman Show. Thanks, Dean. It's nice to be here. Beautiful, uh, fair, fairly beautiful day here, fall day in on Long Island up in Setauket. I know you're familiar with it a little bit. As long as it's not snowing, it's beautiful. I know that. Uh, <laughs> I know that you have two homes and two studios that you you go back and forth from uh, Manhattan. Yes, and uh, you're also a little bit further east from the studio here, my home and the studio right. that you're out in Quag. That's which right. is a, a beautiful town that uh, I've been to. If you told me when I was a young man that I would have a house near the beach and a beautiful apartment in the city, I would say, how would that be possible? Well, that's unbelievable. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty pretty damn good. Yeah, I'm very lucky. But I want to thank you for making time for your extremely busy schedule to uh, come on the show. Thank you. Okay. Pleasure to be here. Uh, there's two things we got to talk about before okay. we get into your great, uh, inspiring, educational, and worldly life story. Um, two things is, is the first thing we have to talk about is, uh, how you and I met that we met through our children. And I know that, uh, my son Jared and his beautiful bride and wife, Alexa Rose got married this past June. And, uh, I had an opportunity to witness uh, your stepson, Matt, who I love, uh, just a great, he's got to come on the show, but, uh, this uh, stepson of yours, Matt, should be on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> he is an amazing dancer. He is uh, just an amazing... He's, he's amazing human being, actually. And his lovely girlfriend... He was a wild kid, though, I'll tell you Really? That. Oh, really? He was, uh, you say it, someone's a handful, he was a truckful. He was a truckful? Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. So you came into his, into his life at what age? Matt was 10. Yeah, come on! You gotta then. You gotta. You can't leave it at that. You gotta tell us a little bit. Uh, you gotta tell us a little bit more about Matt. I, well, that I, uh, that I don't even know. To tell you more about Matt would, would be that I would have to tell you something about Dorothy. I met Dorothy through um, her best friend. It's a, it doesn't matter how we met, but we met and uh, we're in the same business at that time. I'm no longer in that business, which was TV video. We'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, yes, um, but. Um, I had lunch with Dorothy, and in the first 30 minutes, I knew I was 41 at that time. And I knew in the first 30 minutes that I was going to marry her. It wasn't the next 30 minutes that you met her son, Matt, that you, that you, were, that <laughs> no. you weren't going to see Dorothy no. anymore. No. Uh, so <laughs> after lunch, we were right around Bryant Park, because I, I worked right around there. And we sat in Bryant Park. This was in the last Tuesday in June. In 1994, I guess it was. Yeah, 94. Maybe 93. And uh, so we sat in in, in, River, in um, Bryant Park and we did the whole life download. Both of us did. I had to get back to work, but we, we talked and exchanged what life stories we could in that amount of time. And I was completely head over heels crazy for her. And... Um, I don't know if she knew it or not, but I knew it. And at the very end, I said, you know, I got to get back to work. And she's, she had to go. Uh, she said, oh, and by the way, I have a 10-year-old son. <laughs> Which, in her experience, is usually the guy would shake her hand and say, well, very nice to meet you. See you later. Thanks very, <laughs> thanks very much. Nice talking to you. But for me, um, I never really wanted to have... a. I was a Manhattan guy, and I never really wanted to have a baby and then move to the suburbs and get a minivan and do all of that. That was just not for me. But when Dorothy said, you know, I have a 10-year-old son, and she'd been divorced for eight years at that point, mm. I thought to myself, whoa, this is perfect. 
I, I, I can have a parenting experience. She didn't know I was thinking this, but I thought I could be a parenting experience. And I went to summer camp. I was lucky enough to go to summer camp. And I said, it'll be like camp. Wow. wow. I'll be like a camp counselor. Wow. Because I had done that. And I love playing with little kids and um, sports. And and then when I met Matt, he was 10. Um, I have to I have to explain. I have to tell you the moment when we met. He was a, an athlete. Um. And Dorothy said that he loved football. He was football crazy. And he was a... I've experienced that with him throwing the football. Oh, you have? Pretty, pretty... I think a quarterback, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. Really good, uh, from what I understand. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Right. I mean, he played Big Ten football right. at University of Illinois. He was a third-string quarterback. But to be third-string quarterback for University of Illinois, that's pretty big stuff. Pretty big Big Ten. Oh, yeah. no, it, I don't think oh, univer- yes. Big Ten was oh, yeah. University of Illinois. Yeah, the Fighting Illini. You bet. Absolutely. We love in this house, we love uh, the Big Ten, and uh, right. we're very big. Uh, Michigan, I think. Go Blue, Michigan. Yeah. Jim Harborough. So, um, I, Dorothy, uh, after we had gone out for I don't know how many weeks, Matt had, was in summer camp when Dorothy and I met, and she was not going to introduce me to him right away i think a single mother has to be judicious about introducing someone she's going out with with her only son i mm. think that's not a something you take lightly and so the time came for us to meet after maybe we were together for six weeks and went far together in six weeks so i decided to to uh, pick them up and go to the amusement park of my childhood playland in rye Oh, very, so I, very familiar with it. So I pulled up, because I grew up in New Rochelle. So I pulled up in front of the building at 97th and West End, and I was looking for Dorothy and a kid, and I didn't see them. And I get out of the car, and I see that they're about mm, 15, 20 yards up the street on the sidewalk. Hmm. And then I see this little kid rear back, and th- and he's getting ready to throw this football to me. And I say at this moment that whatever I do, if I have to jump into traffic, if I have to jump over a car, if I have to get creamed by a car, I have to catch, catch this football. Wow. It's I, I realize the And he probably the, threw a bullet. The import of the moment. Wow. And I, I had no idea what he was gonna do, but mm. I had played football and I had been I was a receiver, so I had pretty decent hands. <laughs> and he threw the ball and I had all my concentration on this ball and I watched the laces revolve and rotate around which is what you do. Wow. And I put my hand, he threw the perfect, I mean, it was right. Perfect spot. Right to my hands. Wow. Perfect. And that's how we began. So the rest is history. Well, not exactly, but it was a, it was a well, heck, we're not going to have a good start. Matt's going to have to come on as a guest because we're not going to do an hour show uh, that we're going to talk about Matt uh, this entire I will, show. I will, but there is there is more that, we, yeah. that I've got to say about him. But, but in football, I will tell you that when he played at Fordham Prep, um, I'd come home after uh, a long day at work and it'd be cold and icy and rainy. And we were only a block away from Riverside Park. He said, can we go down? Let's go out and have a throw mm. in the dark, in the cold. And I, I, I never said no. So we always went. And I got to tell you, this kid can throw the football he's, pretty hard. And he's, I, uh, had, I had sore fingers. He's very uh, humble and quiet about his football his football talents. He was terrific. He was great. He was well. Let's was really great. Let's talk about someone else great in his life. Uh, someone that uh, our family, my wife Sharon and our our, our kids know very well. Mm. But uh, his lovely uh, girlfriend Joanna. Right. Yes. That uh, we've known Joanna for twenty two years. We we've go known back her for two years. She's best friends with my daughter yes. Allison, and uh, they met at Sleepway Camp, right. uh, Bryn Mawr, uh, years and years ago, and have remained joined by the hip. You know, once in a while, a battle I hear on the phones over the years. You know, girls uh, growing up, but uh, Joanna's been through She's this house gal. many, many times. She's witnessed uh, a lot of a lot of action here. Uh, <laughs> In this house where the studio is, Love but Joanna. they're a great couple. Yeah, uh, Joanna are. has a great family uh, that yeah. we know over the years, and uh, really special. But he he definitely should be on Dancing uh, with the Stars, Matt. He is. Uh, I've never. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, at, at uh, my son's wedding, he very was, creative. He was electrifying. He, I know. Uh, I he know. was. Uh, he could really be a. Uh, you could have. Uh, you could have Matt and uh, with my daughter Allison's personality, they could both uh, be party planners and uh, run he, the whole social scene. He on, gets it uh, from his mother. Really? Yeah, oh, his mother. Like I think in another life, 
if she had her way in a different life, she would she would have been a, a dancer. Wow. A professional dancer. So they really, uh, my daughter Allison, her personality, uh, more on the social and the comedian side, uh, her and Matt, between yeah, his Allison, dancing and, and her, Allie's, I just know Allie Allie's and Allie's Blackman. Sk- <laughs> I don't even know the first name. They all but call her as Blackman. She's funny. High energy she's girl. High energy. Oh, yeah. Unbelievably high very, energy. Very sweet and smiley and fun. So listen, I know, fun. I know you're a big sports fan, just I like am. I am. I uh, how do you like that? Uh, World Series, the Chicago you know, last, Cubs. I gotta tell you, last night's game was like watching six or seven, six or seven different games. It was incredible. It kept on unfolding and unfolding, and all the little mini dramas that that baseball is so um, famous for that I that I miss because I haven't watched baseball for years. Uh, just I just love I'm, baseball. I'm a Yankee fan forever, and I was a Mantle Maris freak, and always a Yankee fan. And I don't. I fell off the wagon the last couple of years. I. And I, I'm not even going to get into it why, but I had a reason because it makes me feel, it makes me sound stupid, but I just had my reasons and I haven't watched baseball at all, especially after Derek Jeter left. Okay. And I love Derek Jeter. I mean, he exemplifies the greatest of all attributes and hard work and go to work attitude as a baseball player. And Is that your favorite baseball player of all time? No, Mi- no, Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle. Of course. Okay. It's not even a question. So mantle, mantle when you were younger, yes. and uh, yeah. and Jeter later yes. on, later yeah. on, those two. Yeah. Wow. I mean, who knew when I was a kid? Who knew what mantle was doing? Right. After hours. You know, living here in New York, uh, you know, this World Series. I think even if you weren't a baseball fan, was just a, fantastic, a, a phenomenal, unbelievable, international. Yes. A phenomenon. I mean, and both teams were excellent. 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 Cleveland could have easily won that game last year. Yeah, night. where there was a little bit of a letdown was the yeah. rain the rain delay. You know, yeah. that oh, yeah. uh that who, was a letdown from a fan uh perspective and I think it uh I think Cleveland had some pretty good momentum going there they did. when they tied it up. And but I they think re- they I resurrected think, themselves in the tenth inning. Yeah, but I think when you when you had that rain delay and you gotta come back when you have that momentum. It's hard. Uh there's a little bit uh, gas taken out and well, it's from, tough to it, but it's cuts you know, both, ways. both had to deal with it. Exactly. That's what that's, that's what it is. But this whole curse of the Billy Goat, you're familiar with that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I mean, 108 years. Yeah. That uh, I like the Bartman curse just as well. That's a that's that a, poor that's guy. some curse. That poor guy. You know, so my good friend uh, Dusty Baker was the manager of uh, of the Chicago Bulls back then during that uh, that playoff series. That was uh, of the Cubs. That was a killer. That was a killer when when yes. when, when Moises Alou went over to the foul line. His glove reaching up right, to catch that right. ball, and Bartman, Steve Bartman, really stayed within the. He didn't. He didn't reach over really uh, that much onto onto the field, but uh, he, did he too was. Much. He did too much. So between Bartman and, and he's and, paid for it. <laughs> between Bartman and the Billy Goat, uh, the Billy Goat curse of this Billy Cyanus that goes back to 1945, their World Series, the Cubs uh, against the Detroit Tigers at Wrigley Field. He actually came to that game with a goat. <laughs> he's walking the goat around the stadium, and this goat just smells just awful that everybody's booing him, kicking him out, and he just said to the Wrigleys and everybody with the Cubs, you're never going to win ever a World <laughs> Series ever again. But it was uh, very exciting. Yeah. I was really pulling for the Cubs after all these baseball. years. I mean, 108 years. I thought it was a yes. great seven-game series. Yeah, but you know, Cleveland was 68 years for, for, for the Indians, too. Right. 68 years. Right, right. So take your pick. Okay, you know? okay. So listen, let's get, let's get to my featured guest, uh, Steve Albert. Uh, I can't... Uh, your story and your career, I mean, for the transition that that you made from was uh, easy. T- t- amazing amazing was well, not easy i mean my transition yeah uh you know at 42 43 and then continuing on at 59 i kept searching for that transition i couldn't find it until the past four months doing this radio show well i tell you my transition um was made clear by my wife dorothy wow um I had been as a TV producer, yeah, I want, director. Let me let me oh, just okay. let me let me just you know set the audience sure. up sure. that uh, Steve Albert, you know, is you know as I say a legendary, world class fine art painter. 
I mean, we're talking about someone that today says putting paint on a canvas is everything to you. It's true. I mean, that's how you feel. But this gentleman, uh, he made a transition, a career transition from a TV producer to a fine art painter at the age of 49. Mm. I mean, what made you, what made you uh, want to be a TV, you know, TV producer? And what was that transition like? I mean, there has to be, even going back further, growing up as a young man, there had to be, there had to be something and, and people in your life that triggered you to want to have a career as a TV producer. And if you could share with me in the audience. Sure. That history as a, as a young man and, and how that all came about. It started when I was a kid. I was a, um, an only child. Um, parents uh, divorced when I was 12. So the... Their marriage was not great. And as an only child in the suburbs, um, only children spend a lot of time alone. Suburbs? You grew up in what town? New Rochelle, New York. New Rochelle, New York. And uh, on rainy days, I was relegated to the house. So I watched a lot of television. Television was my babysitter. Wow. And that was the golden age of television in the 1950s. I knew the entire schedule. Mm. If I was sick, that was like, great. I could watch TV all day. Wow. So I... I and I loved comedy, and I just watched a lot of television. And then um, between television and, and playing sports, all kinds of sports, that was my way of avoiding the unhappiness that was in my home. Hmm. Um, and I also was, that, was your, that was your escape. Yeah. And I was involved in music as well. I wasn't involved with anything that I could do to not be home. So uh, I was in student government. It was very, very well-rounded. Wow. And um, my mother was a classically trained artist. Brooklyn College, she was a painter. Okay. She was damn good. She could do anything. She had a fine, what we call a, a fine hand. She could draw. She could render anything. She, so so she, some genes from your mother, some genetics. Well, there. genetics, yeah, I guess so. But I, and when, I, when I watched, I would watch her work. But it never occurred to me that that was something that I was going to do. That was her thing mm. when I was a kid. Uh, I was in college as a junior, and I started staying up late at night and started playing around with pen and ink. And then that led to um, oil paints. And um, there was one summer I went on a hitchhiking trip around the United States, 1972. And I traveled around the United States hitchhiking as a solo. And I kept a little book, and I, I, a little diary, and I did drawings hmm. in various places. I, I was all over the West. And when I came back, I was 19, I realized that I was an artist. I don't know how I knew it. But meantime, I was in college uh, as a television radio major. Because when I applied to school, there was nothing I really wanted to be other than I wanted to be in the military. But the Vietnam War was raging. Was was raging. In fact, I had wanted to go to West Point. In fact, my father and I had met with our local congressman. I guess in 1967, um, maybe early 68, and he said, "Would you like me to initiate the paperwork? I think you can get into West Point." And you know, I had been to West Point many, many times. We used to run high school track meets up there. I was a sprinter. Um, been there go to Bear Mountain, then we go to West... I've been to West Point. Beautiful, many, many, beautiful oh. up there. Spectacular, oh. that area. Bear Mountain, there's, West Point. Well, West Point, there's something really that always tugs at me when I go there. I get... I it, It's deeply, deeply moving. So this is interesting. You, It's my understanding you didn't want to go to college. You wanted I didn't to... Want, I did not want to go to college. You wanted to... I knew to, I was not ready for college. I knew I needed... I knew I needed some... I wanted to be in a place where I could get an experience to grow up in, which wound up that experience actually was in the Catskill Mountains as a busboy. Wow. That was the hardest I've ever worked. Ever. Mm. That was difficult physically, mentally, emotionally. It was crazy. I'm sure it was crazy. Insane. And, and, uh, and, and you and dealt with uh, a lot. Seven in the there. morning till 930 at night. I a mean, lot of interesting people went up to the cats. Oh, my God. <laughs> the guests, the, uh, the kitchen, lot of, the kitchen uh, staff, the other yeah. busboys. And we had 1,000 people, eight a meal three times a day. You probably served a lot of uh, uh, matzo ball soup and oh, yeah. uh, yes. and, <laughs> and kefilte fish. Right. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stories that came out of that. But it was 
it was survival of the fittest. And that's where I, I knew that I needed to learn survival skills in the world. And I wanted a I wanted a hard experience and I wanted to be in the military. But what happened was after we went to see our local congressman, he said, I'll initiate the paperwork for West Point. Uh, the, the, the statistic came out at that time saying that the average lifespan of a second lieutenant West Point graduate in Vietnam was about two and a half weeks. Wow. So my father and I looked at each other. We said, well, maybe this is not the time to do this, right, right particularly right. right now. That was at, at, the, at the heat of the Vietnam, Vietnam War. War. We were losing the most. Right. And um, so I went to college. I had a two S deferment, and I had a high lottery number. And by the time I graduated college in 1973, the war was winding down. And so I, I missed it. And it is my greatest regret now. Not doing that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yep. Incredible. It's my only one real regret besides Did, my mother not living long enough to meet my wife. Okay. And so, so obviously how many years were you a TV producer? 30. So you did go to college. I did. What college was it? Ithaca College. Had Ithaca. A, had a great TV program. They had a great TV program. Because yeah. I, I don't hear that too often at uh, colleges. I mean, what other colleges have a have oh, a great... Oh, there's a lot. So many of them now. Um, Emerson, Syracuse, uh, UCLA. When I came out of college, TV was still kind of a, a special, I wouldn't say elite, but it, it had not been overrun. When I was working at CBS News in the late 70s, the colleges were spitting out thousands and thousands of young men and women who wanted to be in the industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then video, it was all film, and I was a film editor. I was a film editor at local news at CBS, and then I became a producer at, at NBC. Uh, and then video came out, and the technology changed, where film was a very intense and difficult craft, there's a lot of stuff that you had to know, how to handle film. and uh, It was a lot to know. And video, there was less to know. It was just wow. about pushing buttons. You still had to know how to tell stories. But the technology became a lot simpler when you could just press a, a button and it'd be an image on the screen mm. as opposed to exposures and, 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 and developing film baths and handling and work prints and all the technology of 16 millimeter film, which was very... Wow, you must have learned, Arcane. learned a tremendous... I did. Uh, I did. And uh, I loved it. And I wanted eventually to make movies. I had made a documentary on my own about something I was into, marathon running in my late 20s. And wow. it um, it did very, very well. It uh, won awards and it was on HBO. And it got me out of the editing room, which I wanted to do. I wanted to become a producer because I knew I was a producer. And that film did that for me. And the next step after that would have been what I really had wanted to do. I wanted to direct movies. Wow. So I remember going out to California and staying with a friend for about two weeks and coming to the realization that Southern California, Los Angeles was just not for me. Hmm. That I'm a Manhattan guy. And at that point I made a decision that the, I wanted, I had to work for myself in the video business, whatever I had to do, as long as I could work for myself, that would be fine. Hmm. And along the way, I had a few jobs. I had some bosses that were completely unmanageable for me. And I thank my last boss for being so difficult that I said, never again. Never again. I'm never having another boss again, ever. I would sleep on a park bench. You made up the. You made up your mind. That, that was it. That uh, was it. The rest of your career in life, I'm you're gonna it. you're gonna be your own boss and yep. and not yep. have uh, anyone uh, superiors to report so to. So what happened was that uh, at one point I I did a series of training videos for a company that was a big client for a long time, and I had done sixteen or seventeen of these training films uh, videos in the course of nine months, and when it was over, I said to my wife, "I am done." I am out of this business. I, 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 I'm, I'm running out of, there's nothing more I want to do in it. It's been repetitive. I was in corporate video for 15 years. It was very profitable. I did well. I had a good time. I worked with some wonderful people, but I, I just didn't want to do it anymore. So that run was for how many years, Steve? That was 15 years 15 in years. corporate video. Well, listen, let's go back to, you, you said that you regretted not going to West Point. So much and so that in 1985, when I found myself at the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Yeah, I won it. I had a major, surprising. I was with a friend, and we were walking along the mall, and I said, "What is that dark thing over there, down the right?" 
And she said, oh, that's the Vietnam. And it just had opened up two years before. And we went over there. And then I left her to the side. And I had an enormous experience. It was June or July. It was very hot and humid, as Washington is in the summertime. And I had a major um, experience when I saw you know, people leave things at the wall. When I go to D.C., I go to D.C. a lot right now, 22 trips last year, and I try to get to the wall as often as I can. And um, people leave items at the wall, right. flowers and, and, and more. And there was a letter from a mother to a son. It was in a plastic stand, and I bent down to read, start to read the letter, and she had written a letter to her son. It was his birthday on that day. Wow. And I could only read the first two sentences. And yeah, I could tell. I go ahead, pull it's, you. It's pull, very emotional. Pull yourself together. I know. I I, I was going to bring up that. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, after you chose not to, you know, after you chose not to uh, go to West Point and even consider the lifespan of two and a half weeks in Vietnam, that I know that uh, Steve and I, I see. Uh, the emotions and your and tears and just uh, getting emotional right now. I know how much that first uh, experience to Washington and when you experience that uh, Vietnam Wall and if nobody's ever experienced it before, it had a major, major impact on I, your your life moving on from there. I, and I, I don't even know why, but but I read this first two sentences, this mother writing, today is your birthday, and I lost it. <clears throat> and um, I broke down into a ball of tears and 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 mucus, and I was a mess. Mm. And I didn't want anybody to see me, but there I was. And finally, I figured a way to drag myself out of there. And when I walked away, I put that experience, I put it in a little box and buried it. Wow. somewhere what period of time was this in your life 1985 uh, i had just i was um it was a time when i was struggling actually i was just sort of coming back from a i had gotten to a very high place in the business and then a big project that was promised to me a very big project was promised to me disappeared as often does in that business and i was young and uh i was devastated by that so i had a I was in my beginning of, of kind of a coming back to coming back to life after being destroyed by that experience. So this was this was at a time when I was just resurrecting myself. I was thirty, as I said, thirty five somewhere. Yeah, like well that. that that TV producer background. I can only imagine how high pressured uh, every day. It's was. high pressure. Uh, yeah, and it's very very de very deadlines. very I, high pressure. So I I assume that. This experience in Washington at the Vietnam Wall and what you went through emotionally. I mean, even just sitting here, I see, you know, just giving you a chance to just to recover still from that moment back when you were yeah. still at that age. Yeah. That uh, is, is was that the uh, starting point that you really made this TV producer career change? No, no, no. no. it was way before. Okay. It was way before. It was just a, it, at that point. It was an isolated experience. I don't relate it to anything. But I was so surprised, Dean, that I was there and I looked at the names on the wall and this this survivor guilt that I had, and I felt like this was the war of your era. <clears throat> there are guys on this wall who are my age. I don't know anybody who died there, but I had access and experiences with guys in college who had gone and come back very very different than when they had gone wow. it was a horror it was a horrible thing i used to get we used to, my roommate and i used to get a tape every couple of weeks from a guy who we knew who went into the jungle and he would record a tape and he it, it he got weirder and weirder as time and we would sit there with the tape and we'd say okay you're ready to go before he hits play and we had to gather ourselves and get ready to hear hmm. what was and you could hear artillery in the background sometimes it was completely crazy so there i was in front of the wall and saying all these guys died, how come my name is not on this wall? Wow. And I didn't even go, you know. And I felt, I felt very, very guilty. Hmm. And I don't, I cannot tell you why. And you still feel that way today? I, totally. Wow. Wow. I cannot tell you why. Wow. So, so, so this was, tran this it was like a seed that was in that was implanted. It was like a little flower that I let dry. 
Wow. And then in 2003, I'd already be, made my transition to becoming a painter. I was painting landscapes and uh, things like that. And then we were at war in Iraq. And it was on my birthday, November 16th, 2003. I was 52 years old. And there was an article in the front section of the New York Times about two Black Hawk helicopters of ours that collided in midair over northern Iraq. Wow. And we lost 17 people. And for some reason, that event grabbed me around my throat. And I said to myself, um, I need to make a Black Hawk helicopter painting in honor of them. Yeah, I know that you were, you had this unbelievable passion about yeah. Black Hawk helicopters. But, but something crazy happened. I made a little 9 by 12 um painting as a as a practice painting before i made a big one and i called a friend of mine uh, in quag who was a very patriotic fellow and i said jim you got to come over i want to show you something he came over and he holds this up it's still gleaming wet and he says oh steve this is this is fantastic and you know i, I have a, a godson who was a black hawk pilot in afghanistan and he's graduating business school in june and i'd like to give them this to him as a gift so he gave me a couple of hundred dollars he drove away and as he drove away i watched his car disappear down the street and i thought to my, myself wow this first little painting of a black hawk helicopter is going to a genuine black hawk pilot wow. that was like a i said how is that possible so that was that was like throwing gasoline on the fire so i made that first black hawk and then i made a whole series of other black hawks big ones small ones i had no idea my wife comes up to the studio and she didn't know I was doing any of this. And she looks around. She goes, what the hell's going on up here? I said, I don't know. What are you going to do with these paintings? I said, I have no idea. Wow. That's unbelievable. <laughs> and I really had no clue. They're not going to go in a gallery. They're not going in anybody's dining room. Right. They don't match anybody's couch. So They're not going into a gallery. I don't know what they were for until... I don't know how many years later, long story short, because it is a long story. I heard on the radio that any American could go to Walter Reed. Now, Walter Reed had moved from the old bad Walt. Oh, no, this is still in the old bad Walter Reed before they closed the old one. That any American citizen could go to Walter Reed and thank uh, wounded soldiers for their service. And yeah, I, was, I think this was back in, what, 2010, I think you visited. No, seven, so it was six. Two, 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 uh, six. six. I said, uh, I want to do that. I said, I, I'm, I, I want to do that. I want to have that experience. I so wanna, I wanna so what was that experience like? Uh, it, let's put it this way. It changed my life only as profoundly as the day I got married. Hmm. That's amazing. Um, I went with two buddies. And we had to make an appointment. You couldn't just show up. You had to make an appointment. And this little Captain Phillips, an army captain, this little stout little Filipino woman very clear-eyed and very direct. She said, okay, I'm going to take you up to the neurology unit. So I, that sounded pretty ominous. And we get in the elevator, and the place was a beehive. Sorry. The place was a beehive of activity. And we get off the elevator, and and we go into a room. I'm with two friends of mine. They're two big guys, much bigger than me. I'm not small, but I'm two big guys. I could barely see in the wall, in the, in the, in the, in the room. And there's this big young guy in his early 20s, in a bed, in, a, in an raised bed, his head had been shaved. He had stitches in his head. Wow. His head looked like a like a baseball with all the stitches. Waffle. And his leg was raised. He was wrapped up in his uh, chest and his midsection. And I looked at him, and I, cu I couldn't breathe. Mm. I said, this is as close to the front lines as, I, as I'll ever be. <clears throat> and I said, I just, I had to remind myself, you have to breathe. You have to breathe. And I, I looked at that guy. I said, you know, if he can be in there, so can I. So I, so I got in there and we talked with him and he was wonderful. And he told us what happened. His father was sitting at the edge of the bed. And then we met another young fella who was wounded. And then we went into an interior room with no windows and a little, little lamp. And there was this scrawny kid sitting on the edge of the bed. His feet did not reach the ground. And um, his family were in the room. But when we got in, his family scurried out. And he, let's put it this way, his, one of his eye, eye sockets had not, was mm. not in the place where it, it had been before. 
Hmm. These were all IED explosions. These were all um, injuries due to IEDs. This was before there was the armament program where the uh, Humvees got proper uh, armor, armor underneath. And he could only see shadow and light. And he stuck his hand out, and he was from Appalachia, and he said, Hi, fellas. And we shook his hand, and three of us could barely could barely breathe in the room with him. He was wow. so profoundly um, wounded, but his attitude, he was so sunny. He was so nice, and he knew that we were upset, and he made us feel comfortable, and um, God knows what he's like today. You know, Steve, while you just uh, get a hold of yourself a little bit, uh, <laughs> you, you are you are just an incredible <laughs> human being. Uh, remarkable how you exemplify for this country and uh, patriotism, oh, patriotism, duty, um, so dedication. Um, you know, for for men and women that have served uh, for this country and the armed forces, it's. Uh, it's really taken your life, and that's captured you so emotionally and physically that your outstanding uh, painting and art artistry, uh, really, it's just, uh, your work is just world-class, legendary. It really, so it, it really is. And, uh, you know, if you... If you if, if anyone would go to uh, stevealpertart.com, Steve Alpert, A-L-P-E-R-T, art.com, you know, there's a unbelievable five-minute video that you have on your website that has military images, mm -hmm. uh, you know, paintings, you know, story of America, and about raising money uh, for veterans. I thought that five minute, minute video was extremely. Thank you. It moved me big time. Thank you. Big time, Steve. Well, that, that day at Walter Reed, I learned about Fisher House. And that was the day Fisher House was the um, Fisher House, for those who don't know, um, is administered by the uh, Fisher family, who also own the Intrepid the extraordinary Fisher um, real estate family in Manhattan. And they build, they raise money and they build multifamily dwellings on VA hospital grounds so that if your son or daughter is wounded, you can stay at a Fisher house and be with your, with your kid for free for as long mm. as you want. And they build these Fisher houses and then the government takes them over. Wow. So I learned about Fisher house that day. And then a year later, I donated the first nine paintings, uh, a series of nine paintings, to the Monmouth County um, fundraising chapter wow. for Fisher House. That's we, great. We raised forty thousand dollars. Every wow. penny went, and um, that was the beginning. When I that was when I realized what the paintings were for. They were for raising money and and expanding consciousness about veterans. Um, the thing that bothered me the most uh, along this path was when. Um, the the, uh, the 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 flag draped caskets or transfer cases as they're called uh, came back to Dover and they were photographed. They came back to Dover Air Force Base. If you're an, a government employee, whether you're a teacher or in any shape, way, or form connected with the government, and you die, your remains remains get sent back to Dover Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a, a painting called Duter, "Duty, Honor, Courage" that I made um, of the of the Air Force, of the Honor Guard, carrying a flag-draped coffin across, transfer case, across the tarmac. And um, that painting wound up at the uh, the Air Mobility Command Museum at Dover. It's, it's, it's there today. Wow. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought of how I transitioned to that. But I, I, I realized that, that my efforts uh, in making these paintings to tell the story of soldiers... Is my calling, wow. and um, I can't tell you personally why it moves me as it does, but it does. And as a matter of fact, I had a meeting yesterday with a very fine gentleman at Fordham University who's involved in the veterans, uh, veterans, and hopefully I'm going to be teaching a a painting class, an art mm -hmm. class workshop for veterans at Fordham University. 
We're just, just, we're just talking, and I hope it gets approved. Um, but this is clearly m my mission, and I don't even feel, I don't even know where it came from, but I feel like it came in through the window. Wow. I didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to do this. Wow. As one thing led to another. But that day at Walter Reed was very impactful, and I've, I've never been the same since, since then. What's incredible, Steve, is how you went from landscapes. Yeah, you went from landscapes. Still doing them to making paintings that honor our men and women in the United States Armed Forces. I was just asked to make a portrait of Bob Dole uh, back in March, and I photographed him in July, the senator, and um, just finishing that. It's a large painting. It's I think I think Dole was once Speaker of the House, too, if uh, I remember. Absolutely. That's correct? Yeah, but yeah. He's addressed as, he's called Senator. Right. You don't call him Mr. Speaker, or anyone call him Senator. And um, he... I met him the week before he turned 93 and uh, um, he was marvelous to be to be with, to be in his presence. And I'm just finishing that portrait now, which I've never done really much in portraits. That was something that would be something that a classically trained artist would would learn about. But mm. um, I'm self-taught and I struggled with this painting and I got to the place where I am very very proud of it i'm just finishing it like this week still putting some final touches on it and um we're gonna unveil it hopefully during inauguration weekend in dc from what i see about you it looks like uh you spend a lot of time in washington I and, and i got a feeling uh that you're uh, around uh, a few presidents and senators and congressmen, a lot of people down there in Washington. Well, not presidents yet, but no, no, I, you know, I, I, I do have a plan to try to do a portrait of the next president if it's only the person who I want, want to be the next president. <laughs> <laughs> we probably need a couple of hours, Steve, to... Uh, is it unbelievable how uh, we're in unprecedented times we that we've never... We can't we've talk, never, we can't we've never seen it. anything like this. I, I could just tell you that that it's so pervasive and it's so unbelievable that I got in the elevator with my dog three days ago. This woman who I know in my building gets in and she looks at me. We exchange pleasantry. She pets my dog. And then she looks up and unprompted, she says, you know... And this is 6 30 in the morning she says you know for 45 minutes this morning i did not think about did not think about the election we wow. weren't even talking about it she just, no and i find wherever you go today uh wherever you go you can't get into conversations no, with people no. about this uh election no it's horrible how about a good portrait how about a good portrait of uh, both candidates of trump and clinton i would choose one of them not, not the other <laughs> okay we won't uh, we won't get into it no. but you know a lot about you and it's interesting how when you look at your career transition and the painting um you say a lot that uh, a lot of your failures uh in, taught you how to make successful paintings yes uh you know the the uh, commercial artist uh, the commercial I shouldn't say commercial a very fine painter wolf Kahn, who is very well known in art circles and right he's uh uh hero of mine in his in his book he says you have to throw away your first 500 paintings mm -hmm. that's a that's a devastating statement but but he but it's true and and i think everybody in life i think failure is is, is the greatest teacher absolutely when you win and you triumph you don't really know exactly why but when you lose you know why hmm. and um yeah i've i failed you know Mickey Mantle, Babe Ruth, they have this, the strikeout records. You got to get up to the plate again. Right. You know, you're talking about transition. When I, I, the transition I made was going from a career as a TV producer, which meant I was traveling at about 100 miles an hour, going to meetings, writing proposals, taking clients to lunch, um, going directing shoots, uh, supervising edits, um, working with scripts, working with the graphic person, choosing the music, a thousand different things every single day. Phone calls, constant contact with a lot of people. When I made the transition, I was in our house out in Long Island for two winters, primarily. And my wife works in the city. I was there with an old dog and music. In I took over one of the bedrooms upstairs, made it into a studio, made a mess in there, but that's, that's what you do. And uh, it was just around September 11th dicey times and i remember when the weather turned this time of the year november and it was dark in the morning and gloomy and i was in the room 
And I said, wow, nobody's calling me. I have nobody to call. Here I am isolated and I have all my gear, all my paints, all my brushes, canvas. I, it was a spiritual experience because what I came down to, I was very depressed because I thought everybody I know is going to work. But here I am in this house alone. Wow. And every Monday I had to fight this uh, oppressive feeling of being depressed. And I think to myself, I worked all this time and here I am at 51 or whatever it was, 49. Here I am. How did I get here? And, and, and then I said to myself, here's the key. Then I, I got to the place. I would have to feel all these negative feelings and beat myself up and you're a failure and what the, what am I doing? And then I finally would get to the place where I would say, well, you know what? I guess God wanted me to be here because I have all this stuff here. And, and now I'm just going to tell myself, shut up and get to work. Turn up the music and get to work. Mm. Damn the torpedoes and full speed ahead. I had to do that every Monday. I had to do that on Tuesday. And it, w it was very, very difficult. But at the same time, I knew intrinsically that that's what I was meant to do. Wow. So how many how many paintings are there to date that you've done? Oh, God. Who, uh, who could count them? You know, thousands. 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 So, so tell me what you experience, your zone that you're in. When you paint today, what are you, what are you feeling? What, what type of zone are you in? Is that that's a fair, a, is that a, a fair question? That's a really great question. That is a great question. Um, I have to get to a place and be in touch with, I, I'm only the vessel that the work comes through. So I have to get into a, I don't, know, I don't want to say, say it's a meditative state all the time, but it's kind of a meditative state. It's a very quiet state. It's a state where I'm not thinking about the Cubs last night. I'm not thinking about anything other than being in the moment. You play golf? I don't play golf. This is my hobby. Don't. This is my hobby. But, but it's a lot like golf. Um, you have to be totally in the moment or tennis or any sports or, or, or anything. When you're concentrating, when you're concentrating on your work, hmm. And, and and how are you going to produce the show and your guests? Everything else is filtered out. You're not thinking about well, going to dinner tonight. You know, your wife asks you to, you have the to-do list. You're not thinking about any of that stuff, about getting the, the car, uh, oil change. You are concentrating only on what you are doing and being in the moment. How, 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 do, you, how do you keep all those distractions it's, it's a how muscle. do you keep how do you keep it's a all muscle. those distractions out? It, it's it's a muscle that you learn to develop it's very that's why I was so depressed in the beginning it was really, no but does it does it come natural or you've got a you've got a that discipline you've got to program yourself for that you know it's it's really interesting you ask that because I'm gonna tell you another great uh, friend and baseball story I've okay. got I got a lot of friends it's, that are baseball you know players. It's, like, it's like opening up a channel it's like turning on it's like it's like opening up a channel and as I said to you before, you become this vessel and you have your oil paints and you have your brush and you have your canvas and you've decided what, what you're going to work on. Many of the paintings I make, I don't plan. But I see them as I've gotten older and more mature as an artist, I, I kind of have a reason for doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm, and, and the, the journey never stops. So how do I get to that place? I'll tell you how. I go up to my studio I get that. I open up the windows. If there's music, if there's a radio, whatever, I get everything set. I pour the paint on the palette. I got the brushes. I know what I'm going to do. And then, and then I'm in heaven. Wow. And then I'm in heaven. Uh, and then I go. And I know I have two, three, four hours, whatever. And um, the phone rings. I choose to take it. Maybe not take it. Um, but I, I set my, I guess it's like being a pilot. You get in the airplane you test all the things you have to test. You have to make sure all systems are go. And then, then you take off. Well, I'm going to tell you the classic story. There's a friend of mine that was a great baseball player. I still consider him probably uh, one of the best, if not uh, the best uh, baseball player of all time. And we won't debate that because I, What's I the debated name? You gotta, for years. He's even going to be a guest on this show one day. You, uh, you have to tell my me good, the name. My good friend, Barry Bonds. Okay. We've, been, we've been friends with Barry uh -huh. for uh, for years and uh, just a more than a baseball player, a great human being who's uh, over the years, the media was not too friendly to him. And right. uh, 
probably controversial very character. very misunderstood became controversial but what how his how how bringing up Barry uh, relates to Steve Albert or relates to you and why I asked you how you get into this uh you you've got to be in a very uh disciplined zone yes emotionally and Correct. and work wise to right. be as creative and as talented of a painter as you are thank you so Barry for being you know I consider him to me, you know, Mantle was great. I was still maybe uh, still a little bit young to really appreciate the Mick uh, back in his days. But uh, the past uh, couple of decades, uh, Bonds is the best uh, that I've ever experienced. Um, so have you ever been to Dodger Stadium in I L.A.? Not, no. Chevis Ravine? Beautiful. One of the, It was one of the most gorgeous stadiums. I've been in that stadium a number of times. You know, there was that great rivalry for you for years, the San Francisco sure, Giants, sure. Los Angeles Dodgers. Right. So I traveled with Barry a lot down to uh, Chevis Ravine. And when, when Barry would come to the plate, that stadium, no one left their seat. No one left their seat. No one went to the, bath the bathroom. No one went to concession stands. I mean, 50,000 people. Right. in Chevis Ravine, sure. Dodger Stadium, booing Barry Bonds. <laughs> and I used to leave that stadium. And I, you know, we we head back to the hotel or whatever, and we talk, and I'd say- How do you do it? How do you do, do you? I said, do you, do you hear that? Do you hear that? No, he does not. He said he doesn't hear Anything. one one word. He's exactly. just so locked in. So when you talk about, uh, you know, his personal life, uh, um, that he has to deal with in life. You know, he went through a very tough time. His dad had cancer, he was traveling. In between uh, an unbelievable year, he was going back and forth to see his dad. Um, so, you know, the rigors of a 162 game schedule, uh, the crowds yelling, he'd be locked in. He doesn't hear one person yelling. So right. uh, you guys, uh, it, it made me think of that with how, same you, thing. how you get into that zone. It's the same thing. And if you're passionate and you're great at what you do and you're able to do that, you're going to just excel. Yeah, he, I'm sure he gets in the batter's box and he settles in there and he's got a stance and he is so in the moment. Right, right. And that's what it's about. And when you read about the great yogis, not Yogi Berra, but, you know, um, uh, the meditation and yoga and, 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 and higher consciousness, they all have that phrase being in the moment right now the great uh, another great baseball player who's not a friend of mine i'm not going to keep dropping names but he's not a great friend but he was the yankee killer for years that's retiring now had his best year ever a big poppy david ortiz of the boston awesome. red sox yeah. okay yeah, he was amazing. where he has said this year that every time he came to yankee stadium he heard that crowd. He did yelling and booing, and it, he it had. It. He, he heard it. it. He loved it. He, it was different than Barry. Oh, really? He loved it. Yeah, but... and that got the that got the adrenaline going. Okay, and he was uh, in my in my time. I look at him. Uh, well, along with Manny Ramirez, I look at Big Poppy David Ortiz, uh, just a great uh, ambassador of the game. And yes. he's the in my lifetime with the New York Yankees, the number one killer. That uh, what he used to do to the Yankees. Oh yeah. He was a Yankee killer. So uh, as sure. time uh, as time went on, um, it, you've uh, any other any other emotional times in your life that really uh, had an impact as a kid growing up uh, I, well, on 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 the painting today. Were there any moments uh, like Walter Reed? And, yes, there was, uh, another, there was a moment. At Vietnam the, War, was there any other uh, emotional moments that really had an impact on your life and your career today? Two, one, took place at, the, at, at this little museum at Dover Air Force Base, which is open to the public. Please go there. Um, they have aircraft that are just fascinating. I'm fascinated with aircraft, and I'm fascinated with the B-17. That's another story. But uh, I was at, um, uh, I was giving this painting away to the Air Mobility Command Museum. And the painting was of the Honor Guard Air Force, the Air Force Honor Guard carrying a flag drape transfer case. And um, we were having an unveiling. And um, some members of the Honor Guard, it was a, a woman in uniform who saw um, there's an African American man in the Honor Guard in the lead on the left of the painting. And she looks at the painting and she goes, that's Sergeant Willis. He's still here. She gets on the phone 
And within about three minutes, I'm standing in there talking to my wife. And all of a sudden, I get a tap on the shoulder and I turn around. And there is Sergeant A.C. Willis standing there looking wow. right at me like he stepped out of the painting. Unbelievable. It was unbelievable. It, I, what I, an experience. I could not speak. I, he goes, you made that painting? I, my throat tightened. I could not. Um, it was very... I said to him, I said, I'm sorry. I said, it's very hard for me to speak. I said, I can't believe you. I said, he said, I'm, he said, come with me. And he got a bunch of his buddies together and he sat in one of the little meeting rooms. He said, now you have to tell me the story of the painting. So that's one moment. It was another moment, two other moments. Uh, this one won't take long, but uh, my wife and I went to Paris uh, three and a half years ago and uh, we went to Omaha Beach on a day trip from Paris. And uh, when we, I know my my World War II history in Europe pretty well. Dorothy, my wife, she knew something happened there. She knew there was a battle, but she didn't really understand under what context and all that, but I did. And I'd been to Normandy before, way further east, but this was Omaha Beach. Hmm. This is this is the place where you, you want to go. And I finally found the access road that went down to the water. There's a big steel sculpture that a French... Sculpt, uh, uh, sculptor donated at the 60th anniversary. I think last year was the 73rd. I want to go there for the 75th in two years. And uh, I found the access road. And we get down there and I see the sculptor and I see the beach. And again, I have this thing tightening up my chest, tightening up my, wow. my throat. Um, I wanted to. <laughs> I want to get down on my knees and pray. I could still I could still feel what had happened there, and uh, I did <laughs> I didn't show any of this to my wife. I just didn't want to I didn't want to get involved. I didn't I didn't want to go there. Had I been there on my own, I probably would have had a little breakdown. But I kept myself together. It was lunchtime, and we walked across the access road. It's still in view of the beach. It's a huge, huge, vast beach, and we we had a lunch, and it. Right, right in view of the access road where the first infantry division came in on wow. their on their way to Paris and Berlin. Wow, a very historic piece of piece of ground, and we sat there drinking coffee and having ham and cheese baguettes. And I felt like this is so wrong. Wow, but we spent the day at Omaha, and uh, and then when you go up to the museum. You go up to the cemetery, the American cemetery, which we've all seen in, in Saving Private Ryan. Um, there's a beautiful, beautiful little museum that tells everything you need to know about what happened at Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944. And, uh, and then we went up to the, to the cemetery. All the, all the white stones are perfectly lined up. The French take care of that place there is not a cigarette butt there is not a, a candy wrapper there is not it looks like they opened the place up for the first time five minutes before you got there wow it is absolutely pristine um and uh so we spent the day at omaha beach and and the german embankments the their pillboxes and their 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 gun positions are still there you can walk in them you still see the tracks that they're that the guns traveled on hmm. and you can just imagine they had mostly polish uh troops uh, polish conscripts that they just threw into the army because hmm. hitler thought that the inversion invasion was going to come to calais so he had uh, he had a couple of panzer divisions in calais and and we skunked him and uh so uh he didn't have his his best troops at nor at uh at Normandy and at Omaha. So I, I could only imagine these poor little Polish kids, you know, they got, they, they the bombardment with the B-17s came early, early before dawn. Wow. They bombed the hell out of them. And I could just imagine them, and the weather had been bad for days there, getting up in the morning and seeing that armada wow. come towards them. And you're standing on the, on the cliffs. Amazing. Where they were. And they looked out and they said, we're going to die today. Wow. And they did. Wow. It, it's it's quite something. In wow. fact, uh, at, at low tide, you can still see the the remains of the mulberries. Mulberries were, um, Churchill came up with this idea, like how are we going to 
um, unload all the supplies and have the supply chain? How are we going to get that to the beach? Because the beach is very, very long and narrow, and not narrow, uh, shallow. So Churchill, the genius that he was, came up with this idea of having floating docks. Uh, not floating docks, that they put into the ground. They, they, they dropped these, what they call mulberries. They were portable docks so that they could unload the tanks and all the mm. troop transports and all the food and all the supplies, ammunition that they needed. And those mulberries are still in the water. So at low tide, they're still protruding. Wow. And when you're walking that beach, you feel, you know that something happened, something very big and profound happened there. Wow. So that was um, extraordinary. And the other um, extraordinary moment happened uh, almost a year ago. I was asked um, to have a triptych that I had made. It's called Portrait of a Woman. It was a woman GI saluting the flag from three different views in the same moment. And um, that triptych was requested to be at the home of the vice president last holiday season. And Dorothy and I were invited for a reception where we had three minutes. You know, we had a long line, like a lot. You wait in a long line, you get about three minutes with the vice president and with his Dr. Jill Biden, and we get your photos taken. And my triptych was up on the wall, which I could barely take in because here I am face to face with Vice President Biden who's a very tall, he's a big guy and he's big teeth and he's, and he's lovely, absolutely lovely. And uh, so we had a moment there and I thought, you know, there I went from this little room in Quag on those rainy days being depressed and pushing myself to make paintings and here it's taken me to the home of the vice president. Wow, wow, what an experience. How could that be? What an experience. Listen, we're gonna, on a, on a lighter moment, <laughs> on a lighter moment, not patriotism, not war, not Vietnam, um, armed forces on a lighter moment. Steve Albert, you've got to tell me about this friend of yours that you did this delicious looking two hot dogs with <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this friend of yours right. that left New York yes. and you did a painting of <laughs> Two delicious looking hot dogs okay. on rolls. It's a good story. With lots of mustard and sauerkraut, sauerkraut the sauerkraut. way I like it. Yeah. And I mean, your portraits, I want to I wanna it's eat on, both those it's hot on, dogs. It's on his mantle, by the um, way. I think we're barbecuing tonight I, the, <laughs> when you were chatting with Sharon there. So, uh, it's a good story. Um, that, tell, me, tell me about this with okay. the two hot dogs. Okay. I, I found it very entertaining. There's a backstory. Um, three years ago, my wife and I were given tickets to a West Point football game. Every, every year we like to go to a West Point game. Um, I don't think we're going this year, but we went last year and we try to go. I love going to football games at West Point. And uh, we were sitting about eight rows off the field and there's a big man standing on the 30 yard line. We're on the 30 and it's General Odierno, former um, chief of staff of the army. And um, apparently he used to play football, and this is his one, this is his favorite thing to do. His staff leaves him, and he just stands at the 30-yard line and watches the game, and he has a moment where everybody's not coming at him. So I took a couple of snapshots. I made a small painting of him standing there, and through a series of friends, I was introduced to a gentleman named Jason Dempsey, who at that time was a lieutenant colonel who worked for General Dempsey, who was the chief of the, he was the chairman of the chief, chiefs of staff. Okay. Uh, no relationship, no no family relationship. That was General Dempsey was the, uh, anyway, so so Jason Dempsey worked for uh, General Martin Dempsey. Okay. And had, and I said, I met Jason. I said, Jason, I, I did a portrait of General Odierno and Jason was a West Pointer also. And he, I said, is there any way I could present this painting to General Odierno? He goes, yeah, I can, I, I can make that happen. And mm. he did. Wow. So in March, I went to the Pentagon with this little painting and um, was shown in to uh, <laughs> the General Odierno's <laughs> office who's the chief of staff in the wow, Army. Wow, what a Pentagon. story. And he's got his, there's two other guys, big guys in the room and, and, a, and a photographer uh, rotating around us, snapping pictures and... I had a moment with him. He's a big guy. And we shook hands. He held my hand for a very long time. I was thinking to myself, wow, we're holding hands for a long time. He keeps on shaking. And he was, he was beaming. He was wonderful. I gave him the painting. He loved it. Just loved it. And so 
uh, I became friendly with Jason Dempsey, who facilitated this meeting. And it turned out that Jason not only was a West Pointer, but had gotten a PhD at Columbia. He had been a White House fellow. Jason Dempsey is, is a best and brightest kind of guy and lovely guy. And uh, it turns out that we both have this love for Gray's papaya mm -hmm. hot dogs on the corner of 72nd and Broadway. So I was passing by there one day and I, I thought to myself, you know, I ought to do a painting for Jason as a thank you. And I took, I, I, I bought two, two dogs and dressed them up like that. And I took a couple of snapshots and then I gave them away because I was not eating them, but I gave them away. And then I made the painting and gave it to Jason and because he was spent time in New York in the Upper West Side. And the name of the painting is called Reality Check. Wow. And he loved it. Unbelievable. And it's still on his mantle down in Arlington. Okay. Boy, we could <laughs> we could go on and on. Forever, yeah. We could go on and on. Is this the longest show you've ever done or what? I, I have, we've been here. Uh, yeah. I, get, I don't even know. <laughs> I hope you're having a good you're time. A very good, uh, you're a very good host. Thank you. <laughs> good. Thank you. I hope, uh, I know before the show started, I hope you enjoyed Sharon's muffins. And, uh, very, I know, did I she know, make the muffin? Yeah. <laughs> I tell you. What, really? Yeah, really absolutely. Good. All our guests get uh, Sharon's Great. muffins when they come here. They love it. Can I get one to go? Yeah, you could get one to go. Absolutely. <laughs> but I know you guys, before I came down to the studio, were talking up a storm. So I hope yeah. uh, I hope with Dorothy that uh, and with Sharon that we could get together with our wives to. and I would love to. break some bread, talk about Matt some more. And I love things. your daughter. Good. She is a a bright piece of sunshine. She's something else. Yeah. I love but her. But I don't dearly. even know her as her, as her first name. Everybody knows her. It's that universe, Blackman. everybody knows her as Blackman. Blackman. No it, one calls her Allison. It's, it's always perfect. Blackman. <laughs> But listen, you've got to uh, you've Thank got you. to tell the audience where how they could learn more about Steve Alpert, where they could go, uh, how they could you know where the galleries are, uh, the galleries where they are all over the country, where they are, how they how how the audience can get into contact okay. with you, uh, websites, whatever. If you could just share that, sure. Um, best uh, option is to go to my website, which is stevealpertart.com, stevealpertart.com. Um, Galleries. I'm in a wonderful gallery at Beacon uh, Fine Art in Red Bank, New Jersey. I'm at Rich Timmons Gallery in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Soon to be, hopefully, at a gallery in Caesars Palace in Las Vegas in the next couple of months. Um, also in um, Johnson City, Texas, the Kirchman Gallery. Uh, but whatever people could go to your website yeah, and my, uh, my website is, all the is, galleries is, are mentioned yeah, and uh, yeah. it's all over the country yes. and uh, accessible and your websites uh, just a, a, an immense talent. Thank you so much. Really. But you Thanks know, there is, you. there is before we, before we leave, there is, uh, there is one political subject that okay. we are going to get into. Okay. And that is, uh, that has nothing to do with uh, Clinton or Trump. Good. But because you are such, you know, listen, the audience heard uh, this whole show, you, your patriotism and how you feel about this country and how you feel about every woman and man that has fought for this country. Uh, your patriotism is just, uh, I know how much you love this country and the people that have fought for the country. I do. So the one political subject that is extremely hot uh, over the past uh, month or two, uh, very hot, still hot is the uh, football player from the San Francisco Giants. Mm. Uh, it's not San Francisco Giants. Yes. San Francisco 49ers, right. not the Giants. Colin I'm Kaepernick. sorry. Colin Ka Kaepernick. Uh, I do have to ask you sure. because of, I mean, your story is inspiring. And how you feel, I mean, you know, how many times you choked up on this show. Yeah, sure. I have to ask you this political story. Sure. How you feel about, and once again, for people that don't know about Colin Ka Kaepernick, you know, he uh, a couple of months ago, he's refused to stand for the national anthem and to, you know, respect the flag, um, you know, that uh, he feels that uh, he's doing this because African-Americans and uh, minorities are oppressed and haven't been treated right. So uh, and I know that he's very busy right now, even trying to teach children this in, in the school systems. Steve Albert, what's your opinion on this? It's a great question. Um and it was very controversial. And my um, my first impression was, "Wow, um, that's that's a that's a really big stand that he's taking." But in light of what has been going on in this country, and and hearkening back to the '60s, which I remember very well, and how that um, that 
my our generation ended the Vietnam War through demonstration and um, and speaking up. And I thought to myself, wow, he's taking this kind of stand. I kind of respect him for that. And then I thought, well, and someone said to me, well, well, Steve, you know, a lot, how do you think veterans would feel about it? And I said, well, I don't know. And I did some research and I saw that a lot of veterans, young veterans back from Afghanistan and Iraq stood up for him and said, you know what? This is what we fought for, to have this kind of freedom for expression. This is what America is about. And then my stepson, Matt, I said, Matt, what do you think? And he said, I think it's an inappropriate venue to express that opinion. I said, okay, I take that in consideration. I said, and he said, what do you think? And I said, I, I think it's interesting. I, I don't feel that bad about it. I think, I think it's interesting to bring it up, hmm. especially in the context of the NFL, which has, in my opinion, has had some very questionable calls in the last couple of years uh, about a lot of things. You know, they're a very, very wealthy organization and they, they can do whatever they want to do. And I just thought that this kind of civil dis civil disobedience um, that's been taken up by others. I even read about uh, a football team in Texas that was doing the same thing. And some black members of the team uh, received death threats and said, we're going to come and burn your house down. Mm. That, that's nice. Um, and in the context of everything that's going on in this election, you can't stay away from the election because it's not just the election. There's a, there's an undercurrent in this country right now that is very, very troubling. And we're having massive breakdowns in all kinds of ways, which I look at hopefully that after a breakdown, you have a breakthrough. And I read about this church in Mississippi last week that was firebombed and and someone wrote vote Trump on the on the church. And that is deeply troubling. It hurts my heart. But in terms of what Colin Kaepernick has done, I, I have more respect for him than I ever had. I, th I thought it took a lot of guts for him to do that. I have tremendous respect for you on how you articulated and your feelings of the event and Colin Ka Kaepernick. Thank you, sir. So I have a lot of respect for you. Thanks. I think you were very fair. Thank you. Um, so what's next for Steve Albert? What's next is uh, completing this uh, portrait of Bob Dole uh, called The Senator. It's a big piece. Um, I am um, working on a new series. I'm just going to, oh, I'm working on a halfway, almost halfway through of a series. I went to Arlington Cemetery many, many times, but a year and a half ago, I was given permission to photograph a funeral, um, a full honor funeral. And a friend of mine who I was introduced through family officiated at this funeral he was a captain with the uh um um the honor guard the um the old guard that does all the ceremonial um duties at arlington and this was his last um of his two-year hitch there this was his last funeral he was officiating at and i said i would like to make a painting of you officiating mm. so he got me permission it was a beautiful day in may 2015 and i snapped about 150 photographs of the entire um, process the entire funeral. Actually, it was uh, it was a 93 year old woman from Islip, who had been a flight nurse in World War II. She flew the wounded from Karachi to um, Cairo. Wow! You can imagine what that wow. must have been like. Not not a lot Amazing. of fun. Amazing. And so she was being buried on the on the same at the same grave site that her husband, who was career Air Force, who had died many years before. So they were uh, together again. And on the Amtrak home that afternoon, I looked at all the photographs and I said, wow, I have a terrific series here. So the series is called Final Salute. I'm just closing in on the third of six. These are large paintings. So I'm, I'm working on that series. I don't know what's going to happen to that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm starting a new series called Courage. This is what it looks like of women wow. who have served. Wow. Or, or Very served. exciting. Very and exciting. the first one I'm going to do is a woman named Dawn Halfacre, who's an extraordinary human being. She was a West Point graduate, starting point guard in the West Point basketball team, deployed to Iraq. Um, she was the in, a captain in charge of a um, an MP station. She was in a patrol in the middle Humvee. RPG comes in, takes the arm off of the fella sitting in front of her, and then takes her arm off. Wow. A beautiful young woman who is now a major entrepreneur in Washington. She takes veterans, trains them in IT, and then places them in uh, in, in positions. She has 200 employees. Wow. She's an extraordinary human being. And I was introduced to her through a mutual friend in April. I asked if I could do her portrait, full-length portrait. 
And so she's going to be coming to New York and I've hired a photographer and a studio. We're going to do a photography session and then I'll get a major painting out of that. And then I have a list of other women who I want to be in that series who includes um, Tammy Duckworth, who is running for Senate now in Illinois. She was a Black Hawk pilot, lost her legs. Um, she's an extraordinary human being. I have a direct line to her, but she doesn't know about this yet. Um, and a woman named Karen Meeker, who was a full colonel in the Army. She's a chaplain. And she's just flying to Landstuhl after the New York Marathon to be the head of all the chaplains at the Army Hospital there. She, and she's also a, a jump master. She has, I don't know, 40, 50 jumps. Extraordinary human being. She'll be in that Courage series as well. So, well, Steve, one one of the <laughs> enjoyments I know that I know that we're we're about an hour and fifteen minutes into this that's show, a, that's a long and time. I could spend a few more hours with you. Thank and you. one of the enjoyments that I get out of this is is to meet people like you, and and that the radio show gives me that opportunity to meet people that I've never met before, and they're such unbelievable, life changing, inspiring, educational, worldly experiences that uh, children and adults that I'm meeting that yep. give me the opportunity to just have this great experience that, and, I'm, and, that I'm having with you today. And give it to others. Yeah, and I yeah, think sure what's uh, what's so unique about us, it's a, it's an environment that's extremely comfortable here in my studio. Absolutely. That's not an interview. No. But it's just a, a, a conversation with Dean. And it's it's really great, and you're you're remarkable. What I've gotten to know about you, uh, you so as a person and your family, thanks, Dean. Um, and just uh, your work is legendary. You're world class. Well, that's very nice. And I hope uh, I hope everybody that's listening to this show, uh, I hope uh, goes to your website, goes to the galleries, and has a chance to uh, learn more about Steve Albert and his work. Thank you. So. On, on that note, um, and you're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on that note, uh, I would like to, I want to hear from all our listeners. Uh, listeners can reach out to us with the uh, free text number for U.S. residents, 631-372-8849. That's 631-372-8849. We'd love to hear from all of you. Include your name and location, and we will mention you on the show. Please don't forget to like us on Facebook and hit the subscribe button on the show's YouTube channel. If you would like to leave a comment, please use the box below. We're also recently on the iTunes platform. You could hear all the shows on iTunes. If you would like to share your story, ideas, and be a guest on the show, go to deanbleckman.com and email me directly. I would like to thank all my listeners for being with us today from all of us at the Dean Blackman Show. Have a great day. You've been listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island, New York. From all of us here, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing your comments via Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and email. And don't forget, you can visit the webpage anytime for the up-and-coming guest list. From all of us here, have a good evening.